Dr. Schmo show number eight. Um, today, you're joined by myself, Michael Dupree, our co-hosts, Emilio and Jefferson, as well as our special guests, uh, Hasi Bawan and Felix. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Uh, just to keep an update going on, uh, Bitcoin price is all over the place. We're at uh, around $8,400 right now, and uh, the Bitcoin ATM market continues to grow. We have 5,645 Bitcoin ATMs uh, online currently, according to Coin ATM Radar, as of today. So uh, that's a very uh, positive thing. Um, I don't know. Where should we start off? Do you guys want to talk about the price a little bit? What's going on here with that? Man, it's fascinating. It's all over the place. Uh, ever since Bach, uh hit the airwaves with their uh, offering, it seems like all the institutional investors are pushing the price down. You know, I think that's they're selling on the news. It's what they're doing. So you think it's going to be a, uh, a long-term downward trend here? Or you uh, think it's just uh, over speculation? All, all sale. All sale. It's, uh, it's on sale right now. Felix, uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about what you do and give us kind of your opinion on what you think the uh, current price is reflecting in the market? Sure. Um, so, uh, you know, like I, I, I'm the co-founder and CEO of ARPA, ARPA. And what we do is uh, it's a layer two, you know, on top of Ethereum right now, but it's going to support more uh, public blockchains. You know, we do privacy preserving computation, you know, to make data uh, flow more freely and in a privacy preserving way. So, and in terms of Bitcoin price, I think, you know, it's definitely on sale. And uh, it's probably because, you know, backed trading volume is quite light in the first, uh, you know, in the first day. So people are thinking, you know, institutionals are quite hesitant in coming into this market. But I think, you know, it's, it's always a trend, you know, it takes time for institutionals to really get past the KYC. I know like several of my, um, you know, the, my familiar kind of connections and they try to pass KYC for that. So I think it's, just, you know, it's over speculation for a short time. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, Hasib, did you want to give a brief introduction to yourself and your uh, brief opinion on what you think the current price is doing? Uh, okay. So yeah, I'm Hasib Awan. I co-founded one of the earliest Bitcoin ATM companies. Uh, back in 2013, uh, was fortunate enough to get early into the game. I don't look at the prices, I just hear prices when someone talks about it. I absolutely have no, I don't look prices for almost months, right? Unless someone specifically mentioned. Uh, because the goal is to keep hold long term. And if you have to hold long hold term, like you don't look at your prices of your house every day, right? Like you don't go to realtor and say, what's the price of my house today? Right, because it doesn't matter because you don't have to sell. So that's one thing. Uh, number two thing, I think price will only go up in the in the future. That's the promise. And if it goes up, it doesn't matter what level it is today. Uh, Bitcoin price, because of the hashing power and all of this kind of political scenario, it does affect in the short term. But I've learned over my short or like maybe relatively long period in, in trading and crypto is that Whenever you try to be very efficient or try to be very smart with pricing, you always get beaten. Like you can't expect price, Bitcoin price to go from $3,000 to $11,000. It's almost impossible to predict that. So don't play a shorter game, just hold. And if you're- There's a lot of external short, forces. Uh, and if you have like so short, then basically just keep on buying over like buy like small quantity every week or every month and then uh, try to crack yeah process. definitely important yeah uh, but yeah uh, I think price is very least important at this point of time because if you are especially even if your goal is to make a lot of money in this crypto uh, just focus on uh, aiming for a long term rather than these small five ten percent changes so the same old thing that you've been saying for years, uh, let's not all worry about the price this moment. Let's just keep investing and keep being part of it. Uh, it it's, it's a personal choice. Right? Everyone have a different opinion on what they want. Some people want to play shorter game, but I'm just saying there's such a riskier asset of cryptocurrency where you can actually go to zero. Don't aim for like shorter gains. It's like either 10, 10x or zero. 
right? It's not a five ten. If you want to play for five ten percent, maybe go into real estate. <laughs> okay, yeah, exactly. Amelia, what do you think about the late uh, price action here? Yeah, um, honestly, it probably has to do with backed. Uh, I mean, everyone always uh, buys the rumor uh, and then sells the news, um, as well as the fact that there's uh, new Bitcoin Ponzi schemes that are kind of arising uh, with uh, well, the plus token exit scam uh, over the summer and now cloud token uh, is going on. And uh, a lot of people are a part of that. And uh, when they get the crypto, they sell. So um, that's going you know, to drive the price down. So things like that uh, are probably a driving force downward. And uh, yeah, that's basically all I can think of. Okay, okay. All right. Well, um, so where do we jump in here? Um, in today's show, we wanted to talk briefly about some of the old ATM stuff that uh, Asib was a part of, but... Maybe first, Felix, would you like to tell us a little bit more about your project and what's going on so that uh, us and our viewers can kind of understand more? Sure. Um, yep. So we are, you know, ARPA is founded in early last year. So it's been a year and a half, you know, we dive you know, into this uh, privacy preserving computation area. Uh, and because, you know, like all the team members, they have... Uh, we have strong backgrounds in like cryptography and uh, and also blockchain and also like cloud infrastructure background, right? So, um, you know, just to give it a little content, uh, you know, data is very important. Everyone knows it. You know, it's the new type of oil in this in this era. And uh, however, you know, like so, like uh, the pri However, data privacy is a very important issue right now. You know, um, European countries they have G GDPR, you know, to protect. Uh, you know, personal privacy, and also you know, recently in China, a lot of like big data company get uh, fined or even get prosecuted uh, um, prosecuted uh, because of you know like um, using uh, using private data from individuals, and also we can see a lot of you know uh, advocates in in the U.S. you know saying you know we should get more um, more data privacy protected, right? So. What we do is, you know, we want to use cryptography um, uh, method called multi-party computation. It's a, it's a cryptographic algorithm, you know, to compute or perform functions on encrypted data, right? So for different parties, you know, for example, you want to share, like, for example, banks want to share blacklist without, like, sharing the raw data, but they want to perform a search, you know, in their encrypted blacklist uh, database, right? So we build infrastructures to combine blockchain technology with um, MPC, multi-party computation technology, you know, to um, to enable those kind of uh, use cases, right? So there are many use cases that we can explore. And right now, you know, we have partnerships in the financial area, you know, to, to do like joint blacklist sharing or multi-borrowing, you know, um, or um, and, uh, and those kind of like data sharing. And in in like healthcare, you know, all the uh, all the hospitals and also um, institutionals, they want to you know share the data with with each other in a privacy preserving way. So we can also build infrastructure on, on those things. Um, so our goal is to make data flow uh, in a privacy preserving way and also you know to extract the data synergy from multiple uh, you know data sources. Uh, that's essentially what we do. Yeah, I do know healthcare. That's a good one because. It's like this. I mean, we've all been to the doctor's office, and I'm sure we signed that piece of paper that said, yeah, the doc can uh, have my medical information. But when's the last time you went back to your old doctor and told them they can no longer have access to your information? Right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I just wish it was easier for my doctors to share information as well. I know that the other day I had to get an x-ray, and I had to go back to the hospital and pick up a copy of the x-ray on a compact disc and take it over to my doctor in the same building because they're not allowed to electronically transmit it because I have to be a party to that or something, which is just, um, you know, it's it's becoming a hassle. Right, but then there I read the news the other day. It's like last week, uh, hackers found uh, something like uh, three or four million medical records online, x-rays, CAT scans, ultrasound, uh, just all available. So, yeah, you, you talk about, you know, you make it easier, and yet they have all these unprotected systems. So yeah, something like this would be 
amazing if uh, more, just even on healthcare, more doctors use it to securely transmit the information. Do you guys well, have it? Like, Go ahead. Yeah, think about social media, you know, like Facebook just got fined for $5 billion uh, for the Cambridge Analytics. You know, like those kind of things happens when, you know, corporations, you know, get hold to user data and uh, to share it, right? So um, in the ideal world, you know, like I can still use Facebook service, but not like disclosing my user data to Facebook or to let them to commercialize them, right? So um, in a way, you know, like I own my data and also I want to monetize it uh, using like uh, using some sort of technology. So MPC is one of those, like the, the spectrum is called trusted computing. Wow. And, uh, and uh, you know, like some chip makers like Intel, they have trusted computing like environments called TED. And but we use you know, a more cryptographic, uh, cryptographic or math uh, type of solution called MPC. So. OK, um, do you guys have any current products out there that you're actually are already deployed that are uh, using this a use case uh, example you could give? Us? Yes. Um, yeah, so we have a partnership with uh, JD, uh, the second largest e-commerce company. Uh, so they have a financial department, like they have a financial arm called JD Digital, right? The JDD. So we did a proof of concept, you know, to uh, perform the blacklist sharing uh, from JD and also from other financial institutions to find those who has bad records in borrowings, right? So financial data is mo probably the most valuable. Uh, and most private data at the moment. Um, so, you know, we take, we tap into that industry uh, using our technology to provide the infrastructure for privacy preserving data sharing. Okay. All right. That's some uh, very uh, deep topics there. Emilio, you have any thoughts on this? Yes. Did you blacklist uh, some of the addresses for the, the e commerce sites or for the shipping addresses, or what are you doing? Right. So, um, so it's a little different, right? So, you know, like you can borrow, so like to purchase um, goods, you know, you can actually borrow from JD Digital, right? So you can you can get some purchase loans. And uh, in other financial institutions like banks, you know, that person might also took out a loan from that bank, right? So JD and the bank wants to communicate to find if that person has multiple borrowings or multiple like bad records. Right, so, so we do it in a privacy-preserving way without disclosing neither JDs or the bank's information to each other, but we find that person's bad records. So that's essentially what we do. Okay, so if someone is, is borrowing to make a purchase on an e-commerce site, so if uh, like a financing option of like, like 12 months and uh, they pay like $100 a month or something like that, but you have to vet them prior to giving them the financing. Yes, yes. So okay. you know, to, to, to decrease the default rate. Yeah. Cool. Very nice. nice. So, so like that. conceivably, ATM operators could use this uh, technology to do cash advances to basically do a credit check on the person before the cash advance is issued without having to see a copy of the actual credit record and having that at risk, right? Mm, we, can, we can say that if there's no collateral on the, the loans or you know it's just like some you know credit they want to take take out the money so yes i think that's going to be a, an interesting topic over the next couple of years here to see how some of these kiosks turn into also things that are lending money because uh even collateralized loans where you're leaving bitcoin uh in the machine so to say obviously it's not stored in the machine but where you're leaving bitcoin in, you know and you're taking out cash and then you're coming and paying back the loan and getting your bitcoin back Oh, that'd be cool. That'd be very cool. Yeah, that's uh, that's credit. You know, that's uh, credit loans, right? Not un uncollateralized loans, basically. And where are you guys operating? Yeah, so we are. So we are based in. Uh, we are based in Beijing, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know, like we also, you know, we hired people from. Uh, mostly, we have the work experience uh, in the U.S. Uh, I worked for you know three four years in New York, and um, my co-founder who used to work for Google, you know, in their Palo Alto office. Oh, very nice. And um, to in in, uh, in Beijing, how how is it how is it different in the U.S. We have social security numbers. In uh, is there some equivalent uh, over there? 
Yeah, yeah, of course. So you have the uh, government ID, so similar to social social uh, SSN, and uh, also you know like you have all different kinds of data, right? So. Um, what kind of I, sources are you guys using to verify who people are, other than just a social security number or a address? Your your mobile phone, like for example, your mobile phone number, and also your device ID, right? Your, your like every every device has a unique device ID, right? So uh, basically, the telecom operator they can track whatever that device um, uses, for example, like the traffic, you know, whatever website, and also the purchases. So basically. You know, like uh, like telecom operators are one big data sources, and for example, JD and Alibaba, you know, those e-commerce websites, they have a lot of like purchase habits for that person, right? And on the government side, you know, um, you know, social security, uh, welfare, and also income and taxing uh, informations are in in the hands of government. So you know, if you want to have like a total or like a whole understanding of the person, you know, you want to uh, combine those parties information however like those parties will not share information with each other because of a lot of things you know a lot of factors right so we want to build like ultimately we want to build infrastructures to you know connect all the all the parties and to share information in a privacy preserving way yeah, but that that's the long term goal got it do you guys do you guys source a lot from social media uh not right now because uh you know like you know, we so um, uh, multi-party computation is a very cutting-edge cryptography, right? So, but the limit right now is the efficiency. Um, so, what we do now is, you know, we have uh, so basically we only analysis the most valuable data. For example, the blacklist, or like within a small scenario, you know, like uh, uh, like a small um, say like uh, uh, you know like thousands of lines of you know data. So that's that that's that's very small. Right. So, um, you know, like we social media uh, data is not as valuable as financial data, like to some to some extent. So gotcha. Gotcha. Emilio, did you have another question over there? Yeah. So you don't have uh, like credit bureaus like we do in the U.S., right? Credit. What would what, you say? Credit, credit bureaus, bureaus like, like we have in the United bureaus. States, TransUnion or Equifax. Yeah. Um, so they are. The, like they are the, the peers in China, um, you know, like central bank runs like a, a credit bureau, of course. And also, I think they um, they gave like kind of certificates to seven companies to do like personal um, credit, you know, credit, you know, credit scores. Right. So, so it's quite similar, I would say. Oh, OK. Very cool. Uh, uh, Hasib, did you have any questions about this, uh, what they're working on over there? So uh, if you look at the entire like premise of uh, all the financial products, they're only built for people who already have a bank account, right? With the cryptocurrencies and specifically with Bitcoin ATM, because they have a KYC policy, you can actually build software for people who are unbanked. That, that's the biggest problem. If I want to have, if already you have a bank account, other company will offer me a real bank account. But what if I don't have a bank account? Like what happens? So the other issue that in this industry that people may suffer when they grow is the ID issue. I think I heard like some kind of like one, one tenth of the world doesn't have an ID or something. The craziest start. They don't have any form of identification. So how can we issue them identification so they can build a digital identity, which means that they live illegal or they live uh, stateless. Now, how can we build a product for that? So I'm not sure about like Hong Kong dynamics. Like I don't know about uh, Asian markets a lot, but in US, even just in US, there's some states where the unbanked or underbanked ratio is up to 50%. So yes, there's a massive market for it. Uh, uh, like I'll give you a personal example. I am so uh, I just moved recently to back to US, and no one was issuing me a credit card, right? And so I had to pay people to issue my credit card. So there are companies which will charge you money. So you will give them like a thousand dollars and then they will give you loan and then you have to pay back the same loan and pay interest on that. How stupid it is. So they are bought lending me my own money and I'm paying them interest on lending me my own money. Right. So mm -hmm. this credit industry is very, very, very massive. Um, everyone is trying to crack the code. 
uh, but no one actually have done it properly. So I hope like, you know, you have some kind of algorithm and a lot of backing because you get out of, uh, uh, you, you do get out of like, you know, you need a watch just to give out loans because a lot of people will start off very well, uh, but they run out of money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you raise a very you know interesting topic because like for the M-Banks, for the M-Banked, right? So a lot of people are M-Banked. So even I, so like I faced the same situation when I first went to the U.S., you know, to for college. You know, I couldn't get my first credit card because I don't have a credit history, right? So, um, so because, you know, because of the, the MPC algorithms uh, efficiency limit at the moment, so we only kind of uh, do, do like small scenario, for example, like blacklist sharing. Um, but, you know, in the long term, um, in the long term, you know, we can have more data sources. For example, if even if I don't have a bank account, maybe I did, you know, on my phone, you know, I have some apps that you know recorded my user behavior and show that I'm a, I'm a you know I'm, I'm a good person with with some income like a constant income, right? So um, it could that you know it could be you know like we can combine those data sources and say that person has the good credit score that can you know get a loan or get a credit card or something. But I think that's that's a long term goal. Yeah, but ultimately it also comes to how do you engage the people who doesn't have any bank account at all, right? Like how do you judge them? Uh, like can Facebook, if someone have like a thousand Facebook friends, do, can they perform better than someone who have 500 Facebook friends, right? These are all kind of metrics. Someone who have a job or a degree has better performance. So these are all underwriting metrics that every com company have came up with. My question is that how, how do we induct the people who doesn't have either of those, right? Mm. They don't have a past. How can you predict their future? Mm. Yeah, like, I, I mean, like it, in the in the past, like in the past, say like five years, you know, one uh, payday loan has been very popular in China, and also right now in the Southeast Asia. Uh, for, in the USA for, also. I, yeah, in yeah. the US as well, because everything happened after you know the US, but you know it really got prospered in uh, in in China and Southeast Asia. And I think the first batch of loans, those companies lend out, they are like blind loans for the M bank, right? Yeah. Uh, those people yep. don't have any data. Uh, they don't have, they don't, probably they don't even have a smartphone. So like, so yep. they lend out the money and to record some data and to, to make their algorithms, um, the risk management algorithms uh, smarter. Right? So yep. it, it has to go through that process, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And some of those just get written off as a cost of creating the metrics, which is exactly. built into the price of these payday loans anyways. Yeah, like those interests are are, are ridiculous, like sometime over 100% like a, APR or something. Yeah, crazy, crazy. So right. I think there's that a good market for something like that. So yeah, it could be an interesting play to finally have reasonable uh, loans from Bitcoin ATM. That'd be awesome. Well, where it would be cool is if we can, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Uh, where it would be cool is if, like he's saying, you know, the first round of uh, loans that are lent out, maybe we, you know, half of them are lost leaders or whatever. But people who actually could build up a reputation of uh, lending and borrowing from us and repaying, uh, we could actually make it much more efficient than like a payday loans place or something like that. Sure. I think it's also though really important to look at Bitcoin collateralized loans, but uh, that might be for another uh, a topic for another subject or another day. Yeah. All right, so I wanted to move along unless Emilio has any last comments there. All right, I wanted to move along then and uh, introduce one of my first friends in the, um, <clears throat> I guess actually my first friend in the Bitcoin ATM space. I met him uh, via introduction from Anthony uh, back at the first Miami Bitcoin conference, and I think uh, he was quite the salesman before we even left the conference. I'd already sent him a wire and uh, uh, bought some ATMs, and uh, that would be Hasib here, and the company that he used to work with was uh, BitAccess, and they had uh, one of the first, if not the first, Bitcoin ATMs in the world that was ever deployed. And uh, everybody in the space knows uh, Hasib. Some of them know him as a different name, but uh, we'll leave that off the table for now. But um, 
So yeah, um, Hasib, uh, how have you over the last? Geez, it's been five years now almost. Uh, over the last five years of watching this ATM industry from a very close, hands-on perspective, uh, I, what do you think, man? Five thousand six hundred ATMs today. Did you did, did you think that was coming this quick? Uh, I know, I know. So anyway, first of all, I'll clarify my name, right? So that's before you put suspicion into people's mind that why does this guy keep on changing name? So my first name is Abdul Atibawan. It's a very long name, right? That's so the why we just is, call you Abdul. Yeah. So the issue is like, you know, a lot of like Muslims, like we have Muhammad or Abdul in the beginning. So generally people don't call the first name. It's like having Mr. Right. Or something. So generally first name doesn't mean anything. Like normally we go with second and last name. Right. So that's why like uh, you probably have heard like 30, you know, probably 30 Abduls in your life, but only one Hasif. So that's the case. So that's why I use uh, this. But anyway, that's one thing. So now uh, coming back, so you can call me Abdul Hasib. It's just that Hasib is more distinguishable. So I'm not changing my name, just FI, right? So <laughs> number two question is talking about like ATM. To be honest, when we started off Bitcoins, I thought it as a joke, right? I thought this is something that would be like uh, maybe uh, you put money in and get out. Like you know, we didn't have any expectation of how the com- industry will come along. But I think a month or two into it, then I really figure out this is how things will will, will move. Uh, to be honest, by this time, I thought we should have already converted all the ATMs into regular ATMs into Bitcoin ATM. It hasn't happened so far, but I think we should have done. Um, I personally believe that these ATMs should do more than it, just selling and buying and selling Bitcoin. I think uh, the con- con- play where these Bitcoin ATMs across the world should actually act as a money remittance. Like, yes, people do money remittance, but there should be way that they will just go in, put a telephone number, and the other person will just receive a text message and he can pick up his cash. Uh, you can issue loans on based on that. These machines can actually act as a deposit machine for like Coinbase. Like imagine you go to ATM, you just verify on the machine, you put money and goes into your, uh, any exchange that you want. You pick up the ATM. I think a lot of ATMs are underutilized, super underutilized, right? It could be maybe lack of scope or lack of interest. I don't know what it is, but uh, I think these machines are very underutilized. I think the revenue should be at least three to four X of what they're making right now, which would eventually reduce the cost of operations and benefit will be passed on to those uh, customers. And uh, if we are talking about specifically about building an actual network of cryptocurrency, you should not build it on top of bank. It's like building Airbnb on top of Marriott. It doesn't work that way. You have to have a network which is operating in parallel to uh, current financial system. And this could be you have cash and you have machines all across the world. It could be human ATMs. It could be physical ATMs. And that's how you build another rail of machines. The growth recently, I think it's getting stagnant now because every bigger city has it now. Like I do call, get a call from people who want to put an ATM in exotic locations, and I always recommend them for novelty. But it doesn't mean that if you put a machine on like Lake Tahoe, it will start working, or like put a machine in the middle of like Yosemite Park, right? Because no Yosemite Park doesn't have an ATM. You can just not put an ATM there, and it may work. Well, I, I learned that recently in Spain when I tried to launch some ATMs in Barcelona. And the commissions and the fees and the competition here is uh, just absolutely crazy. I mean, I'm at this point going to box the ATMs back up and send them back to America because the market here is just uh, nothing. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, you may have uh, put, uh, paid a lot of duties to import in Europe, so it may make sense to just put them anywhere in Europe. Uh, but yes, like people do come across that, hey, I want to buy a, a very expensive location. So... It doesn't have a lot of walk-in customer. Like people who just don't buy Bitcoin ATM, Bitcoin because they just walked into a store, right? It's not a very impulsive decision. Maybe for five ten dollars, but the people who actually want it, they actually go for it. Like that's part of lifestyle. They'll just go into a store and buy Bitcoin ATM. It doesn't matter. I, have to be like, oh, I know with EasyBit that we had people that would drive sometimes hours to use a machine, and they would call us first just to be like, hey. We want to make sure you guys are open and that you have Bitcoin because we drove over there one time and the store was closed or whatever, or you were out of uh, Bitcoin one time. 
So uh, yeah, I completely agree with that. I'm sure Emilio does as well. But these uh, these people are seeking out these ATMs. They're they're using these websites like Coin ATM Radar and I think local Bitcoins now has stopped allowing ATM companies to list. But in general, we're not targeting, and our average customer is not somebody that's walking by and you know they're they're in a cafe to get a coffee and they see the Bitcoin ATM and decide they're going to feed a thousand dollars into it. I mean that's uh, it's just not very likely. Yep. Also, not a lot of people carry with this amount of cash too. Like, how many people in the US people carry with a thousand dollar of cash? And if you're targeting five, ten, twenty dollars, like I don't carry with like maximum I carry with, like hundred dollars on a regular basis, right? Generally, I have like maybe fifty dollars of cash in the US. Uh, it's not safe, and I don't need it. Uh, but like, if you're talking about like uh, putting in a cafe was a mistake, unless you get a restaurant for cheap, because restaurant is a very expensive cost too. Some location will tie you up into very expensive contracts, which means that you have to pay like a thousand dollars per month. And people think that a better location will bring you more revenue, but that's not the case. Uh, people will be okay with getting back and may even find it better if the location is in a discrete location rather than being on the front of everything. Our customers definitely appreciate that. Emilio, what do you uh, find with that? Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, uh, paying a, a high month for uh, high rent is is it doesn't really benefit uh, too much. It doesn't really affect people using the machine or not. And uh, I, I mean, yeah, these machines are definitely underutilized. There's a lot of different possibilities. You could turn these machines into regular ATMs as well as Bitcoin machines. Uh, you could. I, I found this company the other day. What was it that? That does that. They turned one of the Gen uh, Mega machines, the Satoshi ones, into an ATM, a bill payment machine, a check cashing machine, and a money transfer machine. Uh, the only thing they didn't have is Bitcoin. I think it's because uh, Gen Mega put restrictions, and they have that uh, that NDA with uh, with what's his name's company over there, Bitcoin ATM. Yeah, with Genesis uh, Coin, with Evan Rose, I, I like Evan a lot. Yeah. I I agree with Ab or with Abdul as well. That um, I think that these remittances, for example, where put in a phone number to anybody anywhere in the world, go to another Bitcoin ATM and pick up the cash, could be magic. And uh, we're definitely underutilizing machines. And I think loans could also fit really well into these machines. Yeah, the, the loans is a very interesting idea. Uh, I mean, obviously that would probably require more licensure but it, yeah it's definitely an idea it definitely could be profitable i think that the licensure and compliance so far as uh payday loan style loans is probably a lot more cut and dry than whatever licensure is or isn't required to actually buy and sell bitcoins at the machine so maybe we can just all go get a payday loans license pay a hundred bucks or whatever it is and it's that simple <laughs> Uh, but you can pay you off of someone like this too. Like you can ask, like, because the issue is like you don't want to be in a in an industry that you don't know. You can just provide infrastructure, focus on providing better infrastructure. The reason why payday loans are so uh, so uh, popular is because people are in desperate help, right? Uh, they don't want to go to they just go to a payday loan shop and say this is my phone or this is my check and just give me a loan. I need the money right now, like you know. Some people have it for pe reason that they should not be spending money on, but that's what the reality of that is. They are open like till 10 o'clock at night, so people can just walk at 8 o'clock. While if you go to a bank after five, you can't get it. So I think that's the reason. And then they, at that time, they have exhausted all of their options too. So they have gone through. Uh, and once you get into paid and loan cycle, uh, it's very hard to get out of it. To be honest, like some of them rates are like up to. 3x, 4x per year. You pay like 300,000, 300,000% on top of whatever you owe. Um, um, yeah, and it, it's terrible, man. It's terrible. Like I, I was talking to someone, uh, car, like even buying a car, a lot of people buy a new car without even understanding they can't pay the bill. And they will end up in a, in a very shitty situation. And that's where I, I, have, I have a lot of disagreement with accreditation too, which is not the topic of this but like if you if you go for gambling no one asks you for what your financial status is what's your financial health uh but if you want to mention a company they will ask you to go to the accreditation process right and they will ask you on how to how are you doing financially 
can you lose money? But hey, why didn't you ask me while I was gambling? Right? Why didn't you ask me when I wanted to buy like a really expensive car? Or even when I invested into government, uh, like, you know, bonds. Right? But anyways, uh, that's a philosophical discussion. But yes, ATM certainly have a bigger market. But I think uh, the promise of having branchless banking has to come. It's impossible for people to banks to operate these big branches. And if someone can position themselves earlier on with having those branded ATM, like my concept was this. I don't know if I, I, I might have mentioned to you the bullet, but imagine you walk into like a like a small room. They have like a small room, right? You walk into a small room and you walk as a, a chase client. As soon as you enter a chase client, the entire room changes into a chase screen. Because like, they are screens, right? So it turns into blue from inside. And now it's a chase bank ATM. And every time there's an interaction, they will charge you like two dollars. Right? I just to build on uh, some of the things you talked about, there's already uh, companies like uh, Affirm. I don't know if you guys have heard of it. Affirm. Yeah, yeah, they're 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 amazing at what they're doing for traditional lending, micro lending. Uh, you know, you on different websites. So, and they're they're just having such incredible growth that I mean, if you try to call their their sales and marketing team, you know, they don't even return your calls. But in thinking about that in a bit. You know that's a traditional model type of company, right? They their sales and operation require human being to set up a new affirm product on a new website, right? That takes a lot of time, energy, effort, capital, so forth, right? Yeah. So the very model that we have with all the people that are right here in this room uh, would actually be able to set up a decentralized model uh, to where, yeah. for example, auto lending, right? You could easily yeah. build an app. Uh, to offer proper sale, private sale vehicles, you know, for three, four thousand yeah. with built in credit checks, uh, with built in cash withdrawals from any ATM. Yeah, yeah. In the yeah. world. Yeah. So, much better model than trying to deal with a company like a firm. I think that's the uh, whole idea of DeFi, right? DEFI. So, the decentral decentralized finance or something. Yeah, so like get over the centralized party, you know, that has the, the probably like the counterparty risk. So I think you know the the, the most important um, component for a, a DeFi project is to have um, you know is to use probably smart contract or other sort of like technologies to enforce the transaction that happens in under certain conditions. Um, yeah, and I think you know like. Uh, Bitcoin ATM could be a very important um, uh, part of that DeFi play because you know, that is where you know you has the, uh, the that's that's the where you know you get the cash or you get the uh, the Bitcoin or something. You know that's the, the last mile to your customer. Yeah, but I also want to like you mentioned about the offer and everything. Like yeah, it's a good product. I personally don't like to take. I I hate that. Right, I don't prefer to have any kind of debt. But if we look at all this industry, how they are DeFi, the problem that we are facing is underwriting model. How do you base underwriting model on? How can you make sure that people don't, don't default? Or if there's a default, how do you go after collection? Because look at it. Why the interest rates are very high for payday loans? Because their recovery is very low. People who turn up to those last resort are likely not going to pay up, pay pay back because they have been refused by their family, they have been refused by their friends, banks, and even credit card companies. So, uh, so that's why the interest rate is very high. And how do you prefer? So I don't know how do you predict future. I don't know. Maybe uh, Hasi can get a loan, but maybe he's a bad person. How do you define between a uh, person who is likely to pay up and who? Yeah, everyone they have their own. Uh, we, uh, everyone have their own systems, like you know their own underwriting skills. But ultimately, someone has to bite the bullet and take a loss. Uh, I do think though that if we had more loans issued via, like, let's say Bitcoin ATMs or other venues, instead of via these expensive banks, I mean, I look around my block here in Barcelona, and there's three or four of the bank that I bank with within a hundred or two hundred meters of me. And you go in and these all have brand new desks and expensive fancy chairs and TVs everywhere. So maybe at least if we had a bit more decentralized of a market, it would be a more free market and more competitive 
And in the end of the day, we might see the actual consumer paying less uh, than they do currently, even if they still are paying an exorbitant amount because uh, obviously it's a last resort kind of a loan where it's, uh, you know, you're going to have a high default rate. Yeah, right. Uh, actually, I think right, th th that's like... Uh, uh, that's like the exactly uh, obstacle for you know for for uh, for DeFi right now because you, you can't enforce it right. So what if like I take out a credit loan using Bitcoin or other cryptocurrency and I default right? So uh, there's no one that goes after me because this is all you know, decentralized. Um, so that's why I think you know the uh, the Maker DAO you know it's collateralized uh, loans basically you, you, you deposit Ethereum and you take out you know some uh, take out some 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 you know some some loans, um, so so I, I think you know at the moment it's all collateralized uh, loans. If and I th play. I think we'll also find though that uh, it doesn't matter with or without Bitcoin. Maybe on average the Bitcoin user is more technically advanced than the average bank user. I think we'll still find that there's just as many people that make poor human decisions in the Bitcoin space as in the traditional space. So collateralized loans against Bitcoin, let's call them kind of payday loans, even if you want to, or for holders that think that they're going to be able to recover or that Bitcoin's going to go up enough to cover the loan. Um, you know, maybe there's a big market for that. Emilio, you've been kind of quiet over there. What are your thoughts? Uh, um, okay. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, if, uh, if my company were to do payday loans, I, I know Hasib was talking about the high fees and how it's horrible, but, uh, we would definitely do high fees just because, uh, the amount of defaults that are going to be on a payday loan is going to be massive. The reason why there's high fees is because there's going to be a lot of defaults and they need to back that in. So, um, that, I think that's a more of a, a, a reason why people are, are going to pay their loans, maybe they can't get loans from other sources because they're high risk. Uh, I think that's why people go for payday loans. They either pay them or they don't. And if well, they pay them, they need to have, they need to offset the, the ones that default. So, well, um, yes, but that, under the traditional model, right, you didn't have enough information to make that decision, right? Because the information you had available was simply the person that was in front of you and whatever they said, right. that was it. Uh, plus a piece of paper that anybody can fabricate in about five minutes for the laser printer. So uh, the whole point of the model that like ARPA and some of these other companies are coming out with is to be able to rationalize that decision, right? Yeah. And this loan, for example, with Bitcoin, yeah, I mean, obviously that's going to be uh, less fees than someone that just no collateral, just walking up to the machine, asking for a loan. Or right. Uh, we'll, we'll do a soft pull on their and credit. Just so, in general, the uh, machine should be able to do everything that a clerk at a yeah. loan uh, payday loan place is doing. So maybe if we had more competition in the market, eventually the fees would come down a little bit. They're still going to be very high because of the fact that most people are going to default eventually. Right. These are right. the kind of people that are going to borrow until they default. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. But I mean, for example, the collateralized with Bitcoin, I know that would be lower fees than anything else just because we actually make so much money on selling Bitcoin and that's literally what we're going to do with it. Once once they once they uh, apply for the loan, they deposit Bitcoin in, in the machine, uh, we're just going to sell it at a profit. So really not much risk for us and they can get pretty, you know, decent rates for, uh, for the loan. It's a very liquid market. It's not like putting up a watch or an iPhone or a, something exactly. like that is collateral. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that would that 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 has high rates, of course. But yeah, with Bitcoin, it's you know, it's, we we can get rid of it in, in a day, basically. I still agree, though, or I still think that there's going to be just as many people in the Bitcoin space proportionally uh, as there is in the traditional financial markets that desire and seek these kind of last-minute loans, even though they're at a high rate and even yeah. though they know better, just because uh, uh, it's like you know. Just because you use a more technologically advanced form of money doesn't mean that uh, you're any better at spending it or economi economizing. <laughs> I mean, there could be a lot of reasons. I mean, you could be, a, I mean, to be quite fair, you could be a traveler and you're stuck in another country and uh, all you got is your ledger and, you know, you need 500 bucks to get a hotel room or something. That has happened, you know. 
I, I think theoretically, you know, there should be more audience. There should be more targeted, you know, customers for Bitcoin versus for the banks because, you know, they're. I think in like the whole world has ninety percent plus people are unbanked, right? So using cryptocurrency is is probably one of the most convenient uh, way rather than convert them into bank customers. Uh, but you know that requires more, I think, access to Bitcoin. For example, Bitcoin ATM or you know better user experience from the exchanges, because um, I don't think there are many. There, there are like easy access for like normal people, normal person you know, to buy Bitcoin in a very easy way. Actually, I, I really think the limiting factor there's, a, there's really only one, um, and that is uh, being able to easily earn Bitcoin. I think that's what we're missing. I really think that's what we're missing: the ability to earn Bitcoin. Like I, you know, I get my clients still pay me in dollars, and I have to go buy a Bitcoin. I, I ask my clients all the time, "Can you pay me in Bitcoin?" They don't even know what I'm talking about. You should look at Bitwage. They let you accept your payments in bit or in dollars, and they pay you with Bitcoin. Yeah, I know, but it's getting the employer. Actually, Bitwage, that's a good one. I tried to sign up for Bitwage because for about six months, I was paying a bunch of developers in Bitcoin, and I couldn't sign up with them, even though we were processing 15000 a month. They wouldn't take me. I'd love to get them on the show sometime. I know the guys over there, and uh, I actually like them. They seem like good guys, so. So that's where, I mean, another, you talk about DeFi, I'd love to see a DeFi version of Bitwage. Just saying. All right. Well, uh, I want to go back to Haseeb here very briefly. Um, so aside from trying to build other utilities for Bitcoin ATMs, aside from exchanging fiat for crypto, uh, things such as remittances or maybe even loans or this kind of thing, uh, what else do you see going on in this space? You mentioned that... Uh, you're surprised that you haven't seen more traditional ATMs converted into Bitcoin ATMs and that it's growing this fast? Or what do you think the future holds here? Uh, I think it all depends on pricing, to be honest. Like, we have it's been like 10 years since Bitcoin has been launched. And if you understand, like, 10 years is a long time in current space to actually dominate and monopolize an industry. An example would be like iPhone was launched just a year ago. And look at how much they have capitalized in the industry, like, how. How penetrated they have? Uh, Uber, uh, you know, Instagram, Pinterest, WhatsApp, they were all launched around the same time. So, apart from like Bitcoin that being used for speculation reason, we haven't found a real use case for Bitcoin. Yes, we do talk about like, you know, there's only 21 million Bitcoins in the world, but there are a lot of things which are even more scarce than that. You know, uh, you can just make up my signature then they may be i only have five of these but it doesn't mean that it's important in the world so it's a lot it's more like a philosophical question so i just think that uh people are building businesses 99 percent of the businesses which are built in the space in crypto are solution that no one wants right like no one okay uh, like someone will say i'm building uber for bitcoin okay why do you need uber for bitcoin like it will accept Bitcoin payment. Yes, but the point is like, you know, what problem are you solving? No, I'm solving the problem that people should have Bitcoin. So they want to spend. So, but why would someone buy the US dollar, convert them into Bitcoin and then pay the same for Bitcoin too, right? And a lot of people who talk about like Bitcoin being scarce, they have money to buy Bitcoin. 99%, not 99, but maybe 90% of people who are unbanked are because they don't have financial means to save money. Like bank, the prime reason of bank is to save money. And if you look at even average American, uh, at the time of retirement, they don't, the, the most asset they have is $10,000. 10000 that's that, it, it includes their house, they include their car, they include their mobile, it includes everything, $10,000. That's their assets that they have. So I think uh, it's a check in egg problem. Like people are poor, that's why they don't save, but because they don't pro save, they are poor too. Like it's like you live. Uh, so how do you get those people out of poverty, or how do you get make more inclusive society? I think it's more about teaching people how to generate income for themselves, right? Like we have, we certainly have a lot of disparity. A lot of people, for them, America is like a land of dream. But if you look at, if you start walking and see, you'll see how poor people are. So cryptocurrencies. Coming back to cryptocurrencies, I think um, uh, you know we have to educate people not just on buying Bitcoin, but also on how can they improve their life or how can they start saving money or how can they take care of their finances better, right? College education, uh, debt is 
at the highest time, it's unaffordable to go to college in the U.S. Is it part of the problem, you think, that the banks with all their marketing power and their big fancy buildings and all their advisors and such are just kind of uh, keeping people ignorant to how to manage their money? You know, you go in, you talk to your banker, they've got all this fancy stuff, you assume they know what they're doing, and you let them manage your money. Is that maybe part of the problem? Yeah, but you don't have money in the first place. Like, I think it's a basic education problem. I think it's all about media. But media is a, is a more like a enterprise, too. They have to make money. So they centralize everything, talking to someone. And it's a very cliche to say that, hey, terrorism is the biggest issue. But the amount of money that we spend on curbing terrorism, if we spend even one-tenth of that, like how many people get kicked by terrorism every year in the U.S.? Maybe like 10, 20, 30? I'm just giving an example. I'm not saying it should happen. I'm just saying. But now look at the people who get died because of sugar, right? Like simple diseases that they should be cured. Like I'm really millions of Americans for disease that should be cured, right? And what we spend, like maybe one hundredth of that? No, because since the terrorism creates more news, right? You can basically bomb a country and spend trillions of dollars fighting a war. That doesn't make sense at all. You can just ban vaping, just example, because it's convenient. But at the same time, all the stores are open 24 by 7 to sell alcohol, which is more dangerous, right? So you had like, uh, I think uh, only few states in the U.S. allow marijuana, while scientifically it has been proven that it's very less dangerous than alcohol or other, other stuff, right? So question is that people will follow where the money is. A lot of people who came into Bitcoin was because of money. If they say, I, I'm in Bitcoin because of money too, like uh, certainly I have a philosophical too, but it's not basically I'm only care about the cause. If I only care about cause, I'll be out there fixing global warming issue. I'll be out there fixing people's houses. No, I'm, I work in financial sector because it makes money and it's also cool. But it doesn't so, mean we can't actually create some utility. If we can find something where Bitcoin can solve a problem, Instead of just trying to create things around Bitcoin that don't need, aren't needed, aren't desired. Yeah, like Jeff mentioned a very good point that, you know, how can we mention, uh, uh, how can we earn, let people earn Bitcoin? Like right now, the only two ways to make, have Bitcoin is either, number one, is either by uh, having, uh, spending millions of dollars in building infrastructure, right? Number two thing is by buying Bitcoin. And like, if you have to buy Bitcoins, you don't buy like a two dollar Bitcoin. You have to spend like a sizable amount, at least like a thousand dollar to buy some kind of Bitcoin, like at least point one of Bitcoin, right? So it's almost impossible for every person. I'm talking about every person. They don't have thousand dollars in their pocket. They're highly in debt, and uh, they don't have money at all. So if we can set up a system, and even with the Bitcoin, I think eighty percent of Bitcoin is owned by like maybe five percent of people. Like similar, the disparity between or inequality between. Regular financial system and, and crypto the concentration of wealth. Yeah, it's not that hey, a person will have people talk about Bitcoin because they have a lot of Bitcoin. They say buy Bitcoin because it will improve the holding. But not anyone who says Bitcoin is the savior of the world, they will not start giving with the Bitcoin to other people. How you will say, hey, I'm distributing my Bitcoin wealth to other people, right? Maybe one or twi- two. Yes, but uh, uh, it, it, it it's a uh, and that's where it comes to Ponzi scheme, right? You know, a lot of people say, hey, people ask you to buy Bitcoin because they already have Bitcoin. Like they talk about social equality, but no one actually bothered about that. Everyone sold their house and uh, similar to refugee issues, like someone would say, hey, we should let everyone refugee in, but they're not willing to spare a couch for anyone to sleep in their house. But they'll say, cause it's cool to say about this thing, right? It's very sexy to say that, hey, we should let refugee in, we should have a equality, but at the same time we want it just so it could benefit us. What do you think, Emilio? Yeah, I mean, yeah, the social social aspect of, of helping people save their money and manage it better, um, I, I really like that, but uh, just I've lost all confidence in people uh, kind of by operating these Bitcoin machines. I, I see we warn people of these scams and they, they still do it. I, I'm not even sure people should be managing their own money. Uh, I'd love to think that everyone is capable of of yep. doing so, but uh, at the same time, I'm not sure that they can. Yeah, that just goes so, back yeah, to the. So yeah, that's my thoughts. Uh, sorry, that just goes back to the old idea of, you know, you got high school graduates able to tell you all about how uh, the mitochondria and your cells work, 
but they can't even figure out how to manage their own money because they didn't take a class on that, you know. So, uh, but also, I mean, I think there's the other aspect to it that the uh, the economic formulas of today are clearly very broken. I mean, uh, the fact that the feds recently had to inject like 130 billion or some ridiculous amount of money into the market to stabilize it. Obviously, that means there's a problem. I wish I had that button that could print that money, I'm telling you. So, um, yeah, I think that the time is right, you know, for the projects like we see everybody doing on here um, and more out there in the world to devise a new system to a new economic system, a new economic platform that more accurately represents what is being produced, what is being earned and what is being sold and what's being used. Those are the four functions. That's it. I mean, we have the brightest programmers in the world all working on this. We should be able to figure out economics too. And I think one of the great things that Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies, again, does enable is just this global decentralized marketplace for these kinds of banking services. So uh, you're still going to have people that are going to take last minute loans for whatever reason. But maybe if we have more contenders in that market, at least the fees will be more transparent. And in the end of the day, due to competition, the consumers will save more. And as anybody who um, I'm sure everybody in this uh, in this chat today has all lost some Bitcoin here or there at one point or another by accident, lost yeah. a password or gotten hacked or whatever else. And this comes back to another thing, which is the consumer protection aspect. We are very much sheep to these banks and just used to, uh, you know, we just throw our card, swipe our card and boom, it goes on some tab that we have to pay eventually whenever we are going to get rich. You know, we'll be rich by next year, I'm sure. And uh, then if some Nigerian prince uses my card, you know, OK, I just call up my bank and say, hey, and it wasn't me. And, you know, you feel like, hey, that's a great service. You know, this bank is giving me this spending power. This bank is giving me this protection against fraud. But in the end of the day, what is the cost of that? And when we start to decentralize some of these services for loans, for payday advances, uh, even in the ATM space, I think we're going to see a lot lower costs ultimately. Now, right now, sure, it's a rush market where there's so many new entrants and things are just going crazy. So the competition hasn't fully kicked in. But I think ultimately finding services that provide a real utility where Bitcoin can facilitate the process are going to be far more valuable than just, re, you know, uh, replicating all these random things and making them Bitcoin friendly or something. So, sure. um, yeah, I think remittances, loans, all this kind of stuff. Sure, they're evil. Sure, people should be using these uh, services, but maybe we can at least have a free market to compete for these people's uh, loan business and such instead of it just being uh, banks and regulated authorities and this kind of stuff that are... Uh, you know, just the big billion dollar people or whatever. Yeah, yeah. You, you make a really good point. I mean, a lot of the times when people scan that are machines, they're like, well, how about you reverse the payment? Like, can't you reverse it? And uh, it's very hard for people to understand that they they can't get their money back because, you know, if someone steals their, their credit card or their debit card, you know, the, the bank will reverse that. They'll get their money back. But with Bitcoin, well, yeah. well, where does that come from? So, I mean, at the end of the day, it's the people that are using these banks that are paying that. So I can't take the 10% of people that get scammed that use my machines. I can't take that out of my pocket or else I'd have to charge an extra 10% on every transaction. Yeah, so how yeah. much are we actually paying in the end of the day? Or the banks are building these big, beautiful, fancy buildings and refunding everybody who uh, uh, gets drunk and leaves their credit card at a bar or whatever else. I mean, where does all that money come from? It's not coming from the government. It's not coming from thin air. It's coming from us. So, uh, yeah, I'm all for free markets in the banking industry. I mean, yeah, same. Um, I share the same view because uh, I think all over the world, the banking system is kind of bro broken uh, in a way that every government is printing money, right? And at the end of the day, it's the people, uh, you know, to who bear that cost, the, the, the inflation. So, like for Bitcoin, you know, the best thing is the supply is limited, and uh, you know, like you have, you have finite kind of um, additional supply every year. Uh, and so that is the store value aspect of Bitcoin, which drives the price up. 
And in terms of utility, you know, people thought that Bitcoin can do like purchases, but I don't think Bitcoin is suitable for like small purchases. It's suitable for like cross-border transactions, uh, money transactions, uh, and other like uh, and other like kind of big value, you know, uh, exchanges, but not for just daily use of money. Yeah. So I think Bitcoin I completely has agree with a that. lot of utilities. I think it has a lot of utilities as well, but a lot of what we're using it for, uh, you know, like you say, just daily stuff like buying a cup of coffee. It's just not practical. It's not no. usable. There's no reason that I can't use my MX card with its protection stuff, and they just take Bitcoin as well. I mean, uh, eventually they're going to have to. But Bitcoin is really more of a store of value to me than it is a asset transfer system. One other interesting thing is the uh, is the key. You know, like we all lost you know, Bitcoins at some point because you know we forget the keys and actually like so um you know multi-party computation is the technology that we use uh you know it's uh one uh you know one uh use case for that technology is called the threshold signature it's kind of like multi-sig but it's a better it's a better version of multi-sig so you know like in the future you know we can have uh one key that being sharded into like three you know, three shards, three key shards, and sure. you'll always need like two of the two of the three. You know, to open your wallet and use your wallet, and maybe you can serve one shard of the keys. You know, to the you know to the custodian, right? So that allow institutional investors to have more free, have more like assurance uh, to trust to entrust those custodians. All right. Well, I guess we're going to go ahead and wrap this up then. Um, I really wanted to say uh, thank you to Hasib for joining because um, he was one of uh, the first people that I met in the ATM space. And I've seen him at, I don't know, dozens of different conferences. Uh, back in the early days, we'd have three, four, five of us all share in one Motel 8 room and uh, uh -huh. sleeping on floors and couches and everything else. So uh, he was really one of the uh, original guys. And uh Really a good friend and somebody I'm glad uh, to still see is doing well and still see is in the space and enjoying himself. So Abdul or Hasib, as you prefer to be called, uh, really thank you for joining. You look good. and uh, Yeah. Felix, it was really nice to, to meet you and to hear about your project. And I'd love to have you back on the show again another day. Uh, you sound like you are pretty knowledgeable over there. So we really appreciate you uh, spending some time with us. Thanks for the honor. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right, Jeff, Emilio, uh, as usual, great to see you guys. Hope all is well uh, with the both of you. And uh, I think this was a great show. I uh, really appreciate everybody being here. So uh, Joe Schmo, show number eight uh, from Barcelona and all over the world. Uh, have a good day, everyone. Goodbye. Bye. Good day. Bye.